Hello, everyone. How is it going? <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and it is truly lovely to be back here on the stream with you today for part two of video editing with my dear friend Vashi Nedimansky of Vashi Visuals. And for the many thousands and thousands of you who tuned in yesterday, thank you again so much. It was, um, it was awesome. And what was great is we really got to go through um, a whole series of very intense, very, um, well, information-filled workflows around all the sort of basics of setting up, I shouldn't even say basics, all of these incredible optimizations in Premiere to really make editing, whether you're working in 1080, 4K, 6K or beyond, better, more efficient. Vashi shared some of his um, world-renowned tips and tricks around all different types of things with, again, using pancake timelines, using markers, all these really specific things that you're just not gonna find anywhere else. And this is really one of the beautiful things about Adobe Live, right? This is an educational learning environment, and this is what you're gonna get. So we're, we're back with Vashi today for two more hours. And uh, today we're actually gonna be talking about some of my favorite things. I mean, they're all my favorites, but um, audio editing, mixing, color correction, VFX in the timeline, VFX and After Effects, and then, some tips around, you know, doing your deliverables. And, and we're gonna talk, I'm sure, more about codecs. We got into all kinds of codec talk yesterday, which um, was super cool. And again, it's the kind of things which it's hard to find this stuff on the web. You know, there's tons of these little tutorials and things out there, but this is a dude who just, he's been there, he's done it, he's seen it, he does it all. And uh, he's just one of the best people I know. So um, as always, let's just cover a couple quick housekeeping things here, and we're gonna move over to the schedule. So I'm with you with Vashi uh, from 12 till 2 p.m. Pacific today. And then at 2, we have uh, the XD Daily Creative Challenge with former awesome Adobe Creative resident Andrea Epi. And then at 2.30, we've got Andrew and Jennifer returning for Design in the Dark. So uh, again, as always, a full schedule of stuff. Hope you've been enjoying Adobe Live so far today on this fine Tuesday, wherever you are in the world. So as always, uh, a couple of quick shouts to all the many people watching. We're coming to you live on Adobe Live, Behance, YouTube, Twitter, Periscope, and Facebook, to name just a few. So hello, James. Hello, Luana. Belchior. Hey, hey, Desiree. Bavin. Alberto Flores. How's it going? Michelle Hovell, nice to see you. Nursi. Don Haynes. Gillian. Alpesh. Rogelio, great to see you as always. Via, nice to see you, EDMC, Low Poet, wonderful Rohit, and Carlo, and Ashe, great to see you all. And of course, you've got Cody, and Quinn, and Stone Cedar, and Mallory, and Umicorn, and Jay, and Felix, and Re uh, Richard, and Kimberly, and Steve. We've just got people everywhere, and that's what we want. Okay, so here, wait, I was going <laughs> to, I had a little thing I was going to do to bring on Vashi today. So as I said yesterday, he is first and foremost, just an amazing human. Director, editor, producer, sound mixer, cinematographer, and decidedly handsome. Please welcome my friend and yours, the amazing, the awesome, the one and only, with Mellotron intro, Vashi Nedimansky. Hello, Vashi. Great to see you. Wow. Jason. Thank you so much for having me back. I had such a blast yesterday um, spending time with you and learning and sharing. And uh, you. your intro is amazing. Your Mellotron is oh, amazing. Yes. Took me right back to yes. the Beatles. Yes, so indeed. It sounded really, sounded really good. So, yeah, man. I mean, we intro. had such incredible responses yesterday. And uh, as I was saying at, at the top, you know, 
the thing that the information that you're providing here, I mean, we went we went through everything. We're talking about ingest and settings and checkboxes and all of these fundamental things. And I, I, I corrected myself because I said basic and there's nothing basic about it, but it's stuff that you wouldn't necessarily find or stumble upon or even really know about unless someone like you was there over their shoulder kind of giving this advice. So again, thank you so much for myself and the community. Everybody just loved, you know, first of all, you're just in totally inspiring when you're talking about this stuff and your passion just bleeds out of your pores over this. But these are just things you're not gonna find anywhere else. And you had this so concisely laid out and we really nailed it right to time. So I know everyone's super excited to uh, to see what part two There's will more, entail. we got so much more today, yeah. But no, I, thank you for that. I mean, to be completely honest, it's from years of making mistakes where you finally work out a system that does work and, and you work out all the quirks and all the things that are failing you and you have to test, test, test until you find something that works. So it's just a product of time and effort to get to that point. So I'm very happy to share I'm an open book when it comes to the techniques and the solutions and all, all the technology and the creative stuff behind film editing and post-production. So very happy to share that info. Well, this is this is what makes you again just such a such a figure in the industry. And I know in a moment we're going to pull up your site again. I want to remind everyone that uh, you can kind of continue continue learning more after the stream ends today with Vashi at his site vashivisuals.com, and I'll be putting those uh, links into the chat. And Vashi's going to pull up all his information as well. But you know, there's not only great information and lots of stories about. I mean, I, I can remember one of the first blog articles I think that I remember reading. Was doing like music video on a, on like a what is you had some crazy title like on a dime budget or something like twenty dollars rap video twenty dollars yes. we shot it downtown Los Angeles on top of Wilshire ten ten this huge skyscraper looking down at the at the one ten and we, yes. we got the location for only for an hour and a half and I had to shoot a whole video and it worked out well but lots of tips <laughs> and, and tricks in that post so much great stuff in there and that was kind of if I'm remembering because that. Gosh, is that like seven, ten years ago? That's, That's quite like a while ago. That nine article. years ago. Nine years yeah. ago. Yeah. I remember that was still kind of in the the early-ish days of the DSLR boom. So this was that article was so apropos because this was suddenly like, hey, you don't need at the time, what was there only a red one? I don't even think right. we had we didn't have right. Scarlet or anything like that then. So it was like, you don't need a red camera to shoot something that looks amazing. And here's again all these little things that you can do to your Canon, Nikon, whatever 5D, you were shooting yeah, it was on. Canon 5D yeah. Mark II at that point. Yeah. 5D Mark II, again, kind of the the, the breakout Alleged. camera. A yeah. legend in the DSLR world. Um, again, long before mirrorless was really a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so many people benefit, benefited so much from that. And there were so many great things. So I can't wait to get into it today. Yeah. And yes, uh, you know, so I think we should just go ahead and kick in and I'll switch over to your screen yeah, whenever you you're ready. Yeah, my screen. I just want to do a, a quick intro because I'm sure there's yep. lots of people that weren't here yesterday. I'm sure that'll be available. But the um, the goal of this, um, let me know if my screen is up because I just had a couple of things I wanted to show. It is, and I, I see you're still viewing us, so maybe you oh. want to hide the- uh, Oh, there we go. <laughs> That'll help, right? Um, so basically, yeah, I'm Vashi Nedomansky. I'm a feature film editor based out of Los Angeles. Uh, I've been working for 20 years here, and I've, I've edited 11 feature films and lots of other documentaries and you know music videos, all that kind of stuff. And uh, this is some of my work that I've done that I've worked on that I'm really proud of. And again, it's a, it's a journey. And you know, I take little jobs to get to bigger jobs, to get to bigger jobs, to make those relationships. And I'm you know, really proud of that. Um, for anyone that missed yesterday, I'm gonna just be working on my timeline here. Um, we covered the first five chapters. What we're going to do yesterday and today is to just break down the post-production of a feature film, but this is completely applicable to any project that you're working on. It could be a documentary, a music video, a corporate video, whatever. You have to be able to have a flow for your workflow um, for post-production from the point of ingest to the point of delivering the final product, no matter where it goes. So I've broken it down into 10 basically chapters. We covered the first five yesterday, and today we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of audio editing, mixing, color correction, VFX, and both Premiere Pro and After Effects, and then how to make your deliverables and what some of the requirements are. Because it, it's always changing. The, the codecs are always getting improved. Right. Things yes. are always different. So. That's the game plan. And this is all based on my experience. Again, this is what works best for me. I'm going to share it with you. You can try it. You can poo-poo it. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but I'm just proud to be able to collect it all and present it in a concise and elegant way and share it with whoever is interested. So anyone who was here yesterday, great. 
Uh, anyone that's new, first of all, welcome. We'll get into the, the good stuff. And you can always find the first uh, two hours. I'm sure it'll be posted somewhere at some point. They right? are everywhere and already archived. And of course, yes, you oh, can perfect. find them on uh, on Behance, on the Creative Cloud YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel, on Adobe Video, Facebook, and on Twitter Periscope. So, uh, nice. And just to let everyone know, we had nearly 40,000 of you tune wow. in yesterday. So That's a lot um, of people. It's a Jason. lot of people. <laughs> it was amazing. It was so great. And uh, everybody really appreciates you taking the time to do this. So with that, my friend. Yeah. Oh, one more thing before we get into it. Oh, more. OK, yes, go ahead. I'm going to take you a little down. segue. I was going to take you down and right. segue. That's right. Nice. Um, one more thing. Um, at the end of this video, um, this is all based on I have a 69 page PDF that breaks down all 10 of these chapters. And you can, um, it looks like this. This is just the start of it. So it's a really well documented, well produced um, breakdown of the film that I worked on called Six Below. And it, it's what I based these videos on. And I'll show the, the link at the end again, but this is the link that you can download. It's free. You can just go to that um, bit.ly optimize your workflow. You can download that 69 page PDF. That's yours to keep. It breaks down my whole workflow. And I'll put this up at the end of the video as well to, to remind nice. you or if you haven't seen it yet. So awesome. that's our game plan for today. Um, and so do, should we jump into it? What do you think? Let's jump right in. Yeah, we are ready. OK, perfect. So what I've always thought, um, you know, we're going to start with audio. And for me, audio is definitely the, the glue, the glue of the mix, the glue of the project. It's the one thing that can literally save your project and make it better and make it sing, you know, literally, um, you're, you know, they always say audio is like 50% of it, but I think it's more, I think it's more like 65 or 70%. We, we, we both agree yeah. there very strongly. Yeah, yes, totally. And you know, as a musician and as a recordist, mm -hmm. you know, all those, the things that are required. Um, for me, um, in a feature film, you know, there's, there's lots of layers to the sound and everything else. And I always break it down as in here are the components. Yesterday I did the components of a film, but here are the components of the sound in a, in a feature film or, you know, corporate or a documentary or short film. There's speech, foley, ambience, sound effects, and music. And all of these five components have to live together. They have to find their own space in the mix. They all have to be representative um, and creatively enhancing what you're creating um, at the time. So keep in mind, like it, you can't just dump everything on one timeline and say and on one track and say, oh, it'll work itself out. Try and isolate stuff. Make different tracks for different components of the sound. It'll help you organize it and it'll help you level it and balance it later. Um, so this is really important. Yeah. So those are the five components. And, you know, some of them may not have, you know, you may not have music. That's fine. Then your ambience and other things will help fill in those holes. Because there's one thing when you're doing audio and you're watching something, um, if there's bad video, it's crackly or grainy or whatever, but the audio is perfect, it appears to be the director's choice, a creative choice to do that. But if you have, 8K red footage and really bad audio, you can't explain that away. It's no. just a bad mix, Tenant. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, right. <laughs> <coughs> not the only one whom I've heard say that. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, interesting. It's, it's um, and dude, you bring up a really good point, which is because it's interesting. When you think back to, um, and let's kind of, we can relate this to sort of YouTube and kind of, because again, this is where so much video is being consumed and delivered. In the earlier days of YouTube, you know, you had really bad, largely cell phone videos, even yeah. kind of pre-iPhone, right? 2006, low bit rate, horrible quality, and nobody really cared. Right. And then the video got a little better and the sound quality was still pretty bad. Because again, you're talking about, God, they were probably 3GP videos. Who knows what formats we were using for YouTube uh, yeah. for upload. And the audio was like this. That's right. It was always Not terrible, bad. but no one cared. And then shortly after that, though, what you started to get was now we're now we entered, you know, 20, 2010s. Now you've got 4K video and all this stuff, but you would occasionally still get really bad, really bad audio. And what immediately people realize is once the audio sucks, they're out like that's yeah. it. It doesn't matter how amazing the visual is, how many particle systems you have rotating around each other. The audio is bad, unintelligible and not stylistically. So, right. You're just not going to get the viewership. You're not going to get the engagement. Full stop. Totally. Totally. No, I agree completely. That's why I spend the majority of my time on audio. I know what imagery I want. I can cut it together. Then I spend the majority of my time balancing it, filling it in, having it seamless. There's um, when, when as a film editor, feature film editor, when you're reviewing a film with the director or producers, you're basically in the room to catch anything 
that bumps, something that bumps you out of the moment. Right. And it's almost 99% of the time an audio thing, like a click in the track or balance, unbalanced levels where someone's quiet and someone's loud, but they're talking right next to each other. Right. So those are the things that we spend a lot of time on. And to be honest, we talked about it yesterday. As an editor today, you have to be able to handle these tasks. The more skills you have in your toolkit, the more valuable you are, and the more you're probably going to get hired. If you just say, I just cut picture, you got to find someone to do audio, someone else to do the VFX, you're probably not going to get hired. And these are skills that everyone has to learn. Um, and you don't have to be the best at it, but you have to know the concepts behind it and then try to apply them at the simplest level just so you're trying and, and giving back and creating a full balanced mix with good visuals that just plays well because you'll get a much better response. I think you'd agree right. with that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to let them, their imagination to some degree, but... If if they, if the content isn't there, you know, if you, if you left out the mix and you left out the VFX or the basic visuals, kind of hard to use their imagination for everything. So right, you, right. Have to, you have to deliver something that's like, you can imagine where I'm going with this. And that's really, that's kind of enough in most cases, right? They just need totally. to be able to put a, a complete picture, even if it's an unfinished picture together in their mind. And we're talking about director, producer, whomever is kind of doing the reviews and things. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. Um, so that being said, these five elements, once you start combining like music and sound and dialogue and stuff, it's, it's additive and it gets loud very quickly. And once you get the red meters in your, in your meter stuff, bad distortion, clipping, horrible. What most people don't know is six decibels. If you raise something six decibels, that's twice as loud. Two times. Two times. Right. Two times. That's right. So you're just like, I'm just going to bump it like, you know, three or four decibels. What's the big deal? Well, you could be, you do that to one track and then you do that to the music. All of a sudden the mix is twice as loud and it's blown out. So it's a really touchy feely thing. And you know, as a, an amazing recordist and musician and you know, the ins and outs more than anyone. It's, it's almost better. And I do this when well, we'll get into some definite examples. It's better to subtract things. It's a subtractive yes. thing. If you have something that's being EQ'd and it's not loud enough, don't boost the volume. Lower some frequencies that you find that will make everything else come through. And I'll show you how to do that in a, in a minute or two here. But never go with, let's add more volume to this because it's a never ending situation where you get too loud, it craps out, and then you get into those six decibels twice as loud. And no one likes that. It's just a horrible way to go at your mix. Um, and that's, and oh, I, yeah, I want to I want to point something out there too because and actually it, it, to some degree and I, I know you got the clip mixer open right now but it's yeah. it's actually it's somewhat a fault of the of the track mixer in this case because you're right that the I, I don't I don't know track what mixer. it is there, there there there's this there's this desire to raise right oh I can't hear the 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 dialogue yeah. raise the bump, dialogue bump it up bump it up bump it up. Part of that problem is, and see, in the analog days when we're working with like analog boards or even digital boards, but with analog controlled things, everything was by nature. Every, every fader was all, always attenuated. It was always, no one started faders at zero, yeah. right? So we always had everything kind of default at like minus six or whatnot. Here, with, when you start with Premiere, really any NLE, generally all your faders are at zero. Now we're yeah. still kind of measuring in those faders like an analog scale because obviously zero digitally is as loud as you can go. That's why there's headroom on the fader and the track mixer. Yeah. But the problem is, right, you really want to start with everything quieter because if you just start boosting everything and that's kind of where people go, you're right. Not only does it get loud, but it begins to get really unmanageable. And this is, yeah. this is the problems. I'm sure you see this with like, new editors who are doing sound mixing, you just keep boosting everything. Now you're you're just crowding the space. You're overlapping frequency. And then it's impossible to hear what's causing it because you, you've you boosted everything. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it, gets, it becomes a real mess real quickly. Right. And, and that said, which is a great point, um, here's my guidelines. Again, it's different from everyone, but here's a general guideline when you're talking about, well, what should I mix it to? What should I... You know, what yeah. am I looking for? It's because right. it's a completely blind game if you don't know and you don't have experience with doing this. So here's just an overall like eight points that I have for, uh, you know, take a screen cap if you want. It's just for overall mix should be, you know, minus 10 to minus six, max at minus three. Um, you know, dialogue should fall between minus 12 and minus six. Sound effects, music. Obviously, nothing should ever hit zero. That's distorted and clipped. You can't get it back. And that's um, the most essential, dude. I love that you yeah. have it, you know, uh, all caps. Nothing should ever, ever, there's no reason in the 24-bit audio digital domain 
whether you're whether you're tracking it live with boom or in your final mix or compressing, you should never have anything pegging at zero ever. Right. Like it's it just can not, like you like you said yesterday, yeah. it could be like at minus point zero one or whatever, right. but never right. zero. But even that's never like zero. overboard, you know, to say yeah. the least. But, totally, exactly. Yeah. So this is my guide for what's worked for me for getting a mix, you know, and, and finding it. And once again, like the music, once you add music, sound effects, dialogue, they all compile and get additive. So they'll be louder than the, the result will be louder and pushing you up towards that. Now there are tricks we'll talk about later. I'm, I'm curious to hear if you like compressors or hard limiters at the end. And I'll tell you what I like and we'll, and you can mm -hmm. give me your case. Oh, yes. yes. But there are ways to contain it naturally. You might get some, not spikes, but it might sound unnatural, but you can always make sure you never hit zero. There's de definitely easy ways to do that, but you should have an open mix. Like the mix should breathe. It should have some space. It should have dynamics. It should have, it should be up and down, but legible. So it's a really, it's a dance between all these components to try and get something working. But when it does work and then you show it to someone and then they get a great response, like I think the sound mixers and the sound editors in Hollywood, like they're magicians to say the least. When you watch an amazing oh, yeah. film and you're just sucked into the world and you hear everything and, you know, and all those, most of those sounds are, are made from, from nothing or from scratch, right? It's not right. actually on production at the day. They do it later. And there's so much work that goes involved. I've seen some of those Pro Tools timelines where there's oh, 200, yeah. 200 yeah. layers, you know, 300 right. layers for one scene. Just, just for ambient sound, right? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. like just ambient noises, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, it's so true. And, you know, that that's the thing, too, is it's such a, it's a dance, but it's also, it's knowing when to pull things back and when to let things breathe. And, and, and really, specifically, because you're talking about film, I mean, and maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, but you know, when you're mixing a trailer and I think everybody's probably experienced this, you know, trailers are mixed like, and I use the term records because that's my vintage, but they're yeah. mixed like, like singles, right? Yeah. A trailer is meant to be punchy, loud, bombastic. in your face, attention grabbing, bombastic. <laughs> that's why they have all the bass drops. <laughs> Um, there's all this just crazy like stop time, short, you know, hard cuts, boom, fade to black, quick close up, <laughs> super loud, <laughs> hands, right? Yeah. It's mixed like it's like it's going to rock you. Yeah. The film, the finished version, Nothing the one like that, that. <laughs> want, it's not like that, right? Yeah. And it's very yeah. different. And it's a very different mindset mixing for those two mediums. Not that you can't mix a film like a trailer. You can, you absolutely you can. You can, but that um, would be exhausting to It would be experience. exhausting. Yeah, without yes, the dynamics yes. of quiet moments and loud moments, without the dynamics of darkness and lightness, you know, thunder and everything. So right. like, got to mix Right. It. It's it's fatiguing and that's that's yeah. a real thing and I don't I don't think enough people talk about that. We've discussed this actually. Yeah. Um, but it's it's visual and and au and audible fatigue, right? I mean, your ears Ooh. physically do get tired from listening to things too loud over a period of time, just as your eyes do from too much, too much. You know, if everything was just tight and oversaturated and overly <sighs> vibrant, it's you wouldn't much, last. Yeah. Or, yeah, you couldn't watch Lord of the Rings, you know, <laughs> <laughs> with the with clarity, vibrance, and and highlights, you know, bumped up you know, 10,000 nits, you know, it's not going to happen. Oh, I know. And the thing is that I find also, we'll get to the color correction later, but they're mixing in like these dark rooms and like, you know, there's the dark cinema cinematography trend on TV where, you know, right. from Game of Thrones, I did an article about oh, that. Oh, I was going to say, yes, I remember that I article. I did that, you know. <laughs> so it's like, you know, they mix in these dark rooms for post-production and it looks great in the room because it's pitch black and it looks great. Right. We're not watching these in a pitch black room. We're watching the sun blasting in. We're on an iPad, like on a bus or at the beach right. or we're up in a room or whatever. And with your room light. Exactly. Right. Any ambient, ambient light, light room. will kill it. We'll kill it. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, let's get into some practical stuff. Because yes. This is important. So um, this works for, for everything. Um, if you're mixing dialogue and you're going to get into uh, dropping in stuff, one of the most important uh, tips I like to use, and let me get my... Um, I'm going to use, I just had, I had to find, pull some stuff here. Yeah. So I have some, a voice over here that's happening. And um, I'm just going to pretend like this is like, you know, just the, the dialogue from a film and here's my cut that I'm going to drop it into. If I'm going to drop in um, dialogue, I've always been taught, you know, in the past that I'm going to zoom in. So this is my first line of dialogue. I'll make it bigger. Um, 
what I've been taught and what I've had the best experience with is once you drop in the next line of dialogue from someone else, the other person in this you know, imaginary two case scenario, you should always checkerboard your audio, meaning track one should be one person, track two is the other person, right? If you just put it all on one timeline, like that's the first person, this is the second person, it'll work. But when you start messing with the edges, when you start trying to do the fades, ins and outs um, and crossing over, it gets really, it's out of control. Like every different person should have their own track for dialogue. And even at this stage in Premiere Pro, like obviously in Pro Tools, this is just de facto, but I like to obviously um, go back and forth and it's called checkerboarding and you can see why. It's just one down, one up, and then the one on top. And that way you can control each separate line of dialogue. And also if I want this bottom line, I want that dialogue to come earlier, I can slide it to the left and now they're over talking, but I couldn't do that if it's up here because if I slide it to the left, it'll kill this dialogue. Yeah. So yeah. I find it critical to checkerboard my dialogue. So when I'm, you know, when I have, I'll have all the options to decide because as you know, or and most people know in film, sometimes the person's not on camera. So, you know, if this top line is a single of someone and this is another person, I can have them say that at any point, as long as I checkerboard. Mm -hmm. I have it all on one track. I, I, do, not, I do not have that option. Um, and so I find that extremely helpful. And that works for anything, you know, documentaries, whatever, commercials. Every line should have their own separate track. What I think is really interesting, I see, I see it so often where those things are combined. And I wonder if it's, if it's a, it, peep, in someone's mind, it's like, oh, well, I'm trying to consolidate, you know, track real estate on screen. Right. But it becomes a major headache, particularly if you know, both voices are not sort of recorded in the same environment, like you discussed before, varying levels and things. It just gets, it gets yes. too difficult. You can't use a track, a global track control at that point because you know voice A and voice no. B are just too radically different. This, this, and again, I get it, like I get it. I wanna keep things totally, yeah. I would throw everything in one track, but right, then you just don't have the control and okay, there's more scrolling involved or you need more screen real estate. Right. It behooves you in the end to do it this way. It just makes right. it so much easier. And again, I love your concept around all this organization because this will just make you more efficient. That's not marketing. It's just, it no. will. No, and, and you <laughs> can do this will. on any platform. It's just right. any platform. Like, right. If you just say, oh, if you say, oh, do all dialogue goes on track one. Well, no, you're limiting yourself. Right. And like you said, <laughs> right. a really Why? good point, track <laughs> one, if this is one person and track two is another person, this other person could have recorded on another day with an air conditioner on the corner. Right. Exactly. And if you think if you're going to bounce from a clean room to an AC room on every line of dialogue, no one will watch that for more than 30 seconds. They'll be like, I'm done. I'm not going to watch this. This is a joke. Mm -hmm. So then you can address, you know, the first track is clean. The second track, I'll denoise it and then try and get it as close to track one as possible. But without splitting it up, that's not doable. So that's like my first, like, huge thing just again and it is organization and it's just balancing and managing your assets which is has nothing to do with talent it has nothing to do with technology you know it's just being smart and i think if you edit smarter you can get to the finish line quicker and maintain control of all those separate components in your project because it is a giant jigsaw puzzle and you have to find the best way to interlock everything all the pieces mm -hmm. You know? Now, as I'm looking at your timeline, I see that you have obviously use of labeling. And since we, however many versions ago, modified all the labels, I myself, I've always done it in audition, but in Premiere in particular, have become just like label crazy. So, yeah. and us usually I, I conform the label colors to the the audio Certain types, things. dialogue, yep. ambience, uh, Foley, et cetera. Do you basically, do you implement the same kind of system generally or yeah. something Yeah, on similar? a feature film, on a feature film I will because I wanna have consistency and I also want my assistants or anyone else that has to get into the project to understand what's what and, and where things are. And it's a lot easier with that color. If I say like that yellow, if that yellow is always ambience, I'm like, cool, let me go mess with the ambience, do the levels. If everything is green, I'm like, you know, I can look on the left side and name my tracks, but Colors definitely help. On shorter projects, be it a 30 second spot and things I like to cut in between features, I'll, I'll just throw it all in there because I know exactly what it is and the turnaround on those are usually a couple of days. Right. And uh, even though I can go deep, I'm the only one cutting it, I'm the only one mixing it before we hand it off, so I'll just control it. But yeah, any longer project where you're, where you're on it for weeks or months, I, I like to color coordinate everything so I can manage it. It's really important. 
makes sense. And actually, we've got uh, a question over on the Oh, hand. I was going to say, yeah. Oh, if anyone has a question yeah. while we're going, jump in because I'd like to handle it now than later. Yes. Uh, so Ricky uh, Harrington is asking, do you rename your audio tracks per talent? So do you name them based on the speaker or the actor? You yeah. Know, their yeah. I mean, I can go here and I can change audio one and, and change that to, you know, the, the actor's names. And usually the first four tracks are all mono for dialogue. Right. In Premiere, you can use standard because it'll accept either a mono right. or stereo track. So you don't have to have mono, but sometimes I just make it mono for sure. So if something gets in there, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get out of whack. I, I'm sure it's mono. But yeah, I will name those tracks. And I have a template at VashiVisuals.com called um, Blockbuster Video. It's actually um, the template that was used in Mission Impossible that Eddie Hamilton mm -hmm. created in, in Avid. And I ported it over. So all the oh, names nice. are there. And all the tracks are there. It, it's like 25 video tracks and then like right. 20, 27 audio tracks. And they're all, oh all pre-labeled. So you can literally right. drop your stuff in. And again, nothing gets out of whack. And anyone else that's, that you're working with can open it and be like, understand what's what and where it is. So yes, I do name all my tracks. And by the way, since you just mentioned it, and before I pull up another question, mono audio for dialogue. I get asked yeah. this all the time. Yeah. You've heard my thoughts on this, you know, oh, yeah. one, one voice, one, one area where the sound is coming out of mono. It yeah. is mono. You are mono. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm not um, talking through a chorus. Pedal, right, but walking around. Right, no. So, because people always ask like, well, you know, if I'm tracking something or like they're capturing on a system that does, you know, the dual channel mono. So you end up with a stereo file, but it's basically the same program material on the left and yeah. right. Is there any them. benefit to that? And I always say, no. No. no, I mean, the, the only benefit see. is if you have two channels set one for like six dB lower. So right. you have a stereo track that has two different audio levels and then you can right. break those out later in case someone gets over modulated. They talk too loud. You have a backup track that's six dB lower that you can use. That's the exactly. only time. But those yep. are usually two mono tracks recorded, not a stereo, but sometimes exactly stereo. So. Yep. Awesome. Okay, and uh, so now this is kind of a little off topic, but I, I think it's That's a good fun. one, again, kind of in the spirit of what we're doing. So Corey's asking, he's working on his bachelor's in cinematography, and he likes editing, but not quite yet very good at it. Do you think he should go back to school for editing? Thoughts on that? Um, to be honest, like, uh, I don't think you need to go to school to, to become an editor. I think you need to get hands-on and cut everything from make a 15-second film, then make a 30-second film. Make a one minute film. As long as you can tell a story in that time period. I mean, commercials are the greatest example. I've cut hundreds of commercials and the time it takes to cut a 30 second spot. You're like, how hard can it be? Just put some shots together, some music. Oh my God. I did a cam campaign for, uh, for VW. I cut four one minute commercials. Each one of them had 50, ver 50 versions. So I cut 200 versions of these four commercials in one week because all the executives were in, the ad execs were in, and they wanted to see different versions, iterations, iterations. So I learned how to you've got to sometimes throw everything away and start from scratch. But the bottom line is tell a story in that 30 seconds. I mean, you have to tell a story. And if you can do it in 15 seconds or 30, then you can start building up and making it a one minute, five minute, 20 minutes, you know, hour and a half. But it's all experience. It's not about school. And the other thing is, as a cinematographer, I'm sure you're out, you're seeing things, you're experiencing things, you're listening to things, you get music from different places, you read a book, you know, all those experiences help the storytelling process. It's, it's osmosis, I'm telling you, whatever you ingest will subconsciously be in your brain and it'll be pulled out when needed. It's like, it's magic. That's how I live. So try and experience as much as you can. That helps you become a better editor and storyteller because you've, right. you've literally lived it. So right. that's my advice to, to him. Don't nice. go to school. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Yes, you're getting a lot of love out of that. Practice, practice, practice. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Also, also the classic line for how do you get to how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 practice. practice. So, right. right. My great grandparents used to tell me that all the time. Nice. So, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Back to audio. Listen, I can get chat all day. So here's something. Um, as you can see in this track, I have like four lines of dialogue. I got some music and some ambience and stuff going on. Now, what happens is every single one of these shots, if you look, there's a hard in and hard out. So there's no dissolves or anything on any of these. What that's going to cause is, and anyone who's not a seasoned editor in either audio or film, there's going to be clicks and pops as you go from one track or one shot, one shot to the next. These are all different shots cut at different times. So when I play them, 
there'll be different volume levels. It'll click and pop. And if you watch something for 15 seconds and you hear a click every time there's an audio change, you're going to go, you're going to lose your mind. And if you're turning this over to a director or producer, they're going to fire you. So you're like, well, how do I fix that? So the quickest way to fix that in this example here, what I like to do is lasso everything that's that I'm using. Um, I'm not going to do the ambience down here because they're like literally clean and out their digital files that are pre-built. But this is all production audio. Once I do that, I hit Shift D. What that does is it adds a, right now I think I have it set for six frames or eight frames, but it adds a dissolve to every edit point. So now, and they might be too long right now. I know the default is like eight or 12. I like to do a two or four frame dissolve and add it to every clip in my timeline for production audio. What that does is it smooths everything in and out. And so, yeah, I don't know. These are probably too long. Let's see what was the default. Default was, oh, it was like a second. So sorry, my bad. I didn't do the preset, but it should be four frames or two frames. And you'll see that even if you have words on the edges, it won't mess with those words. It'll just guarantee you a smooth transition from one clip to the next. So my default is one minute. Let me just change that. If you want to change it, it's under preferences and is it timeline? Jason, where are the preferences for? Um, Which one are you looking for? Audio transitions. I think it's timeline. I, I think it's moved to timeline now, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So audio transition default. I'm going to do frames and I'm going to do four. I'm going to hit OK. Now back out here, I'm going to undo what I did. And then, so right now, nothing has a dissolve. If I grab everything, my dissolve is now four frames. I hit Shift D, which is my default. And if I zoom in, you'll see every edit point has a four frame dissolve. That's literally one was it one eighth of a second, whatever. And there's, and there's two frames on one side of a, a clip, two frames on the other. This will guarantee you don't get clicks or pops when you're, when you're listening to your audio and doing it back. And I don't have to do it one at a time individually. I can do it on mass. So that is so this will save you. I, yeah. You tell me, yeah, you know that you've done this. I'm sure. Yeah, no, dude, I was yeah. gonna say this was also, this was one of the hidden top. And so in radio, we used to call that topping and tailing yeah. and, uh, that's it, right? If you want to prevent those clicks, because you're cutting, you know, depending upon where you're, someone could be, it's not even a matter of whether they're actually saying anything. Again, a lot of the room tone, the ambient noise on the recording, even if you've got two clips butted up next to one another without a dissolve, yeah. very likely you're going to have some kind of momentary, could be very quiet, but yeah. some kind of little click or click something. Up, and that's digital. We're in a digital and world digital, right? and you can't, when you we're going to get into frame view. Um, yeah. when you look down into the innards of it, like there's so much stuff going on and like one little spike and you're going to get a click and that one yeah. little click can take someone out of the story. And it's, it's bad. Completely. Um, so this is up here. You can see, yeah, with the dialogue up here, you can see since they're on different tracks, there's no chance you're going to bleed over, like get the a breath of this person into this person's line. They're separate and they each have a little four frame thing. So, you know, the audio will be crystal clean. And this also helps if there's like some room noise before they start speaking, it just kind of ramps into it. So it's not completely silent and all of a sudden, and then they start talking. So it helps. It's not a mix per se, but it will save you audio quality and make it sound better than it actually is at an earlier stage, which is always a good thing to have. Nice. So that's, I do that to everything. It's, it's a no brainer. Um, it just makes it sound professional. And then people will think you're professional because you are professional. This is a pro tip. So it's, it's important. Um, so let me, that one's, yeah, I like that one a lot. Let me do this. Um, let's get into it. Audio time units. You're like, what the hell is an audio time unit? So what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to go and zoom all the way. I'm zoomed in all the way. If I go left and right, I'm moving at one frame at a time. Now I can see the words that are in the dialogue here from the waveforms and I'm going one frame at a time. So I'm going to make a cut right here. And then I'm going to go back one frame and make a cut right here. So let me go back to this. So now I have one cut, one little one frame edit. That's the as tight as I can get in. And anyone who's cut dialogue or songs or sounds knows that this one frame sometimes is not good enough to either get out of a word or cut off an effect. You always have to end up like adding some noise or some silence and adding a, a transition to try and cover that gap. And that gets really cumbersome. So 
in dialogue editing, we call this Franken wording. So it's like Frankenstein, right. but Franken wording. Right. So if I want to create a word or change a word, let's say cut an S off someone's dialogue, we can't get them back for ADR. And they said, I like space aliens. And I want to cut that S, that last S off. So it just says space alien. I can do that. I cannot do it in one frame. So what I do is um, I'm in this sequence here. So if I go to the sequence uh, tab and go to the three little hamburger, I'll turn on show audio time units. Once I turn this on, you'll see the top of the timeline has a whole bunch of more numbers. That's because we're now in sample mode. And this is recorded at 48,000 samples per second. So we've just gone from 24 frames in one second to 48,000. So now I couldn't zoom in any further to this, right? And let me make this just so it's evident. Let me just change the color of this to rose. I like rose. So now Someone I'm going to hit asking, Zoom. What's that? I was just asking how you change the label color. So yeah, it's just a right click. Oh, or control right click, click label. label. Right yep. click with a shit. Oops, bad word. Label, and then change to whatever you want. Um, and so now watch me zoom in. Now I can zoom in to like beyond. Like it's it's digital noise, and I don't know if you I don't know if you have we don't have playback of this on my end. I don't think, but but. So I've already gone too far. So I can literally zoom into 40,000 samples where there's, there's, I, I don't even know what, like it's just, it's so far. And so here we are, let me just zoom in so I can. So now I yeah, can and that's in, go, go ahead. I was going to say, and that, that's a good point. As you're saying, I, I can zoom in so far. So what you have to keep in mind is when you're in audio units, right? You're gonna you're gonna keep being able to zoom in. I can't even remember. I think Premiere does allow you to display single samples. Audition certainly does. But yeah. remember that that's that's one forty eight thousandth of a second. So right. when you're moving and shifting things around, oh. what you may notice is that it's stuff isn't like if you're if you're fairly zoomed out in audio units and you try and move something, nudge it a little to the left, whereas that would be the equivalent of maybe one frame. Here. It's not gonna move that way because no. there's so many little incremental movements. So it it takes some finessing to to work in this view and yep. you got to be really careful too right like that oh yeah <laughs> it's amazing but you got to be careful because you can also throw things completely out of sync right accidentally very quickly if i make this bigger so you can see if i scroll yeah. through this is one this is one frame right so 1 24th of a second so i can zoom in and i could not cut this earlier but now yeah. i can take this if this was the letter s you know and then it trails off yep i can just Kill, take this back to here and then it's gone. That's within a frame. I couldn't do that in the other view. Here I could do it. And then with, if that's the end of the yes, I can then apply a default uh, transition and then make that over here as well. So it just goes to nothing. Then yeah. if I back out and I go back to, um, oops, if I go back to regular frame mode, you'll see that I can't even access that area. Right. I just go nope. over it because it's so small. <laughs> You're at subframe you level there. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. subframe. So this is the way to kill S's or, or build words from phonetics. I've had to build words from syllables people have said and had a timeline where I take a F and a A and a T and like make fat, right? Right. Because I'll steal it from somewhere else because we don't have access to them. It can be labor intensive, but it gets you there. And you can't do it in frame mode. You have to be in you know this subframe mode. And once again, you, you go to the sequence and turn on show audio time units. And then when I zoom in, I have access to that ridiculous you know, amount of information. And again, audio is, is key. And if you can solve problems and, and fix stuff here, then it's going to just make your end product better. So that's right. another trick I use all the time. And not, not a lot of people know that one. Uh, nope. Or use it because it is. Or use it, yeah. yeah and yeah. the other, the other learning lesson there again, which you saw Vashi do at the very end. Once you do whatever manipulation you go need, back. And go back, change go it back, back because yeah. again, you'll you'll grab a piece of video and you'll move it. You'll think, oh, I'm moving it three frames, but now you're moving it thirty-seven thousand samples. <laughs> dangerous. Very, yeah, it's dangerous. So you got to yeah. remember: do your change it, do the task, change it back. That's, yep. I, I can't emphasize that enough. <laughs> totally. Um, next next thing I use all the time. We were talking about sub subtractive and additive. Oh, we just were losing Vashi's uh, audio. Oh, we got you back. Oh, can you hear me? You, dro you dropped out for a second there. You know, if I hit play on it, I can't. 
hear, should I go to the, the room or, or no? Should I just explain it? No one can really hear it, right? So it's more um, of an Well, if, you, if you're going through your speakers, if you just crank it up, it should come through your, it'll come through your mic. I have it cranked, but. We might need to change your hardware right output here. because your device is changing. When I hit system. play, I think you lose me. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Should I do that real fast so you can hear it? Or, I mean, oh, how do I, technology. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's look at your hardware output just real quickly. Yeah, let me look. This is yeah, this is what we did yesterday anyway. So we go to preferences, mm -hmm. audio, hardware. Where is this stuff going right now? No, oh, it's going default output headphones. No, we want speaker. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's try that. And now nothing. Nope, I don't hear anything. I was messing with this okay. so much earlier. It's, um, it's probably. I'll just demo it because stuck. you don't have to hear it. Yeah. Right. I think it's in the stream net or whatever, the, the app we're using to stream. Um, mm. But it's not important because it's more of um, actually showing you what's happening. So, on this example here, I have dialogue in the pink. Um, people are talking, and underneath I have a song. And what will happen all, all often is the dialogue and the song fight each other for what you can be, what can be heard, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the answer is let's turn up the dialogue and you turn up the dialogue and then all the effects that you have around it get out of whack because they're too quiet and you get into that nuclear game of bumping everything up until it just distorts out of its mind. If I take the music that's down here and I just lower the volume of the music, then I lose the power of that music. The dialogue will be clear, but the music is kind of you know underneath and you're straining to hear it. Um, so sometimes volume is not the answer to balancing the dialogue with the music. The answer is, is EQ. And what you want to do is you want to remove some of the EQ in the music that lives in the same space as the, as the dialogue. And so you'll still have the highs and lows of the music, but it carves a hole in the mid, in the mids. And the way we do that is if I go, let me bounce out here so I can see my effects. Uh, if I go to my effects control for the music, because that's what I want to do, and we go to our effects panel. Um, what I like to use is parametric EQ and simple parametric EQ, right? It's under filter and EQ. If I grab simple parametric EQ, drop it on the music track, and then here are the settings that I like to use. And if you can see this, if you can't see it, I'll, I'll read it out. 1250 is the center of the Hertz. That's right in the middle of the spectrum of audio where voices live and music lives and they kind of butt heads. The Q is the range of how much of that, that area we want to address. I just use four. You don't have to know what the numbers mean. You just have to know that this works. So four is the spread of how wide of an area from the 1250 we want to include. And then the, the boost is we're not boosting it. We're removing it. So I'll drop it to minus 12 decibels. So it's 1250 hertz, four for the Q, and minus 12 dBs. What this will do, and you can try it on your own, um, it will carve a hole in the uh, in the music. The dialogue will literally, you'll just, you hear every word, but the power of the music is not lost. And yep. this I use all the time instead of trying to fight volume with volume for audio and, and dialogue. And even special effects or ambiences, if there's a certain frequency where you're like, God, it's just fighting the dialogue, throw this preset on. You can save it as a preset or you can just apply it every time. Um, if you do want to save it as a preset with these settings, Right click on simple parametric EQ and say save preset. And then yep. just call it whatever you want. Call it whole in yeah. music. Scoop, scoop, the, scoop the mids. Scoop the mids, exactly. Yeah. And hit OK. Hey, so Go you know ahead. what? A lot of people, maybe we could try, if you want to save this or save a copy, maybe just close Premiere and yeah. relaunch and see if we can get the audio to come back. I'm going to, I'm going to, Pull, I'm going to pull out your screen for a second if you want to try that. Okay. Do you mind? Or I might that? have to go back. Yeah. Let me let me do that. Let me just save this, and I'll I'll just do that. Maybe something happens. Maybe it'll before. just reset. Yeah. Because here's my camera mic, and I'm just checking the audio. Speaker. Oh, I think I think I know why. The speaker. I got it. Speaker should be Realtek. It was in the app for the streaming. Okay. So let's see now. If we're can you hear me? I can still hear you. Yes, indeed. Everybody's loving. They're all like presets. Yes. And I say this all the time. Presets oh, now mean I hear goodness. You. 
I hear you now. Okay. Presets, presets mean goodness, everyone. So, you know, you want to make sure to, to leverage them as much as possible. Sure. All right. We got your, we got your UI coming back. So let's see, yep. I'm going to pull us back up and see if we get any audio coming out of here now. No, it's weird. When I, when I play, press play, I lose your volume. I don't hear you. Uh, let me check one more thing. Sorry for the real time. Uh, hey, listen, you know, it's okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's going out of the speakers. It should be working. Okay, we're not going to worry about it for right now. Okay, you're no just worries, going yeah. to have to believe us. No, yeah, just just look just look at those settings right here. There's twelve fifty four and minus twelve. Just try it anytime you're fighting your dialogue and music. And there's um, a couple of, there's a couple questions here around of around. Oh, hey, Monica, how's it going? Uh, a couple questions around the Q value. So again, yes. higher values. So what that relates to bandwidth. So where yep. he has a twenty uh, a twelve hundred fifty hertz center frequency, a Q of four is is not narrow, but fairly narrow. The higher the value, the more narrow, meaning the less adjacent frequencies you're going to be affecting. The smaller the value of that Q, so let's say 0 0.5, 0 0.2, the more adjacent frequencies you'll be affecting. So yep. by creating like this little, you can see like this little funnel. When it's a you, notch, yeah. A notch, when you attenuate, vroom, you're sucking those frequencies out. Right, and if you widen that cue, now we're taking out. I'm doing this weird thing with my hands. Now we're taking out way too much. Yeah. Now we're taking out less. So this is a good way. It's also known as you can also sweep that cue value, right, with if hot you, text. Yeah. And listen go, to what it's in real doing. time. In, in real, real time, time, you can do this, and then you'll yeah. hear how much it's taking away or adding, and it's you can do that. But this is a great starting point. Just yeah. like literally, you don't have to know anything about music or. or or paramac or EQs or whatever, just just try it and you'll be like, wow, I can hear it. And sometimes it's it's good not to know how it's done, just that it works. Yeah. Which is nice. Mm -hmm. Um we were talking about it yesterday, um, but I wanted to show today. There's if I'm mixing like audio and I'll use the same example. I have a song underneath and I have the music, sorry, the dialogue up top. Um if I wanted to make sure the music like swells in the gaps in between the dialogue. What I usually have to do is I take my pen tool in the timeline by holding, is it control on PC? Yeah, control. And then I just add keyframes in this timeline and I can't hear it because you know it's not playing back. And then I can raise and lower by grabbing in between, I can raise and lower the actual volume. It's called rubber banding. It's, you know, it's a staple in all of editing lowering and raising the, the volume of, of, of stuff. Problem with this is I don't get to hear it in real time. And that is kind of a pain. So what we did yesterday, which is in the preferences, and I'll, I'll show you right now, there's a way to have automated where you can hear everything. We can automate this process and actually do it in real time. So you can hear and interact. Um, in the preferences under audio, we have, you have to turn this on. This is called Automation keyframe optimization. It's a mouthful, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, turn on linear keyframe thinning and minimum time interval should be around 750. So it's almost a second. It's in between a half second and a second. It's a good starting point. What this does is it'll add keyframes to, this, to the track I'm interacting with and I can ride the levels or ride the faders and go up and down. So to demo that, this has to be done in the clip mixer. Okay, the clip mixer is a window that you know you should have open somewhere, and it's going to show you which tracks are playing back and the levels of that track right now. Right now we're in track six and seven. Oh, so you can see six and seven over these levels. Track seven is my song. And oh, tell me if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're wide. Your 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 connection's cutting out a little, but you're back again. We got okay, you. Okay, there. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. So, all right. So I have this audio here, the song. I'm gonna do this automation to the song. So with the clip mixer, take track seven. All I have to do is turn on right keyframes. If I click this, it's like the adding effects and, and stuff. I click this, it's now active. And this is the fader for this track, track seven. So now in the timeline, if I hit play, I Did we lose you again? Okay, now play. 
Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming you through. You're, you're sounding a little Borg-like. Uh-oh. Okay. Let's see if it's uh, if it's better now. How about now? Is that better? That is better. Okay. So what was the last thing? If I hit play, I lose my mic. So I had to stop it there. But I what see. I was, okay. if, if it helps, on track seven, once I hit play, I use the slider up and down the fader, and it created these keyframes for me in my timeline. And that's automatic. So when it's playing back on my end, I can hear the music, I can hear the dialogue, and I can decide when to dip up and down. So by, by utilizing the clip mixer, turning on the right keyframes and using the fader while it's playing, I can real time adjust the levels of the music so it stays out of the dialogue. I can make swells. If I want the music to suddenly grow and get big, I yep. can do it here in the clip mixer, not the track mixer, only the clip mixer. And then that way I can do it in real time and I don't have to craft these keyframes and then go back later if I have to make any changes. So right. you do. And that, as right? you scrub through that with your, uh, with the playhead there, you should see the, you should see the faders moving. Yeah, yeah. So you can yeah. see, even though we're not listening to it, as he's dragging through, you can see the fader automation moving. So it's, that used to be known as via the SSL consoles, flying fader automation flying in, the, in the late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Yeah. Um, but that's exactly what that is. So you're actually getting the visual feedback, not only the visual of the keyframe generation on the clip, but you're seeing it in the mixer as well, which is really useful. Again, it's, it's like super, super awesome. easy to understand and you can quickly overwrite. If you, if you overcorrect, you make the music too loud, it swells too much. You can, you can go back and just redo it. It's yeah, really you simple. Can redo it, or, same, you can even, or you can grab the keyframe in the time, in the actual timeline and, and make that change. That will, exactly. that will show you there too. So it's yep. interactive. Both are connected at all times. Mm -hmm. um, since we're getting to the end of audio, like the end of the hour here, there's two more things. Um, what I like to do, um, here we go. So Jason, what's your choice? If I'm doing dialogue, for example, this is all dialogue and I wanna make sure it's all consistent and I don't want anything to, to distort, do you use a compressor or limiter? I like to use the hard limiter. So, uh, and we'll Good question. The difference. Yeah. So uh, usually, usually for just dialogue, I'll go to compression, and, and okay. here's why. So you can certainly use a limiter. The reason I generally use compression first is if, in particular, if it's very dynamic. So yeah. if someone's speech is just too erratic, where it's not meant to be, um, a compressor can be used just to handle those very out of band moments and peaks to just kind of squeeze everything back into a, a, a more um, equal sound. Yeah. That's it. Now, having said that, um, a lot of times, if it's really out of whack, like, you know, and I I, <laughs> I tend to speak like this in actual life, you know, where it's very quiet and then very loud all of a sudden, this is where you might want to use a limiter too, um, because now this is going to squeeze, it's going to squish down the higher, the, the, the louder parts, but also yep. amplify the quieter parts to again, kind of meet in the middle. So it, it kind of depends on the source material. There are some times where I will go to something like a hard limiter or just use a compressor with a ratio over 10 to one, yeah. which effectively turns it into a limiter. The difference with a hard limiter, of course, is that you're setting your ceiling. So it'll never exceed right. minus six or minus 10. And I absolutely do that, especially when I have like a, a grouped dialogue set a hard limiter so that nothing ever goes above minus six or minus two. Everyone gets start yelling and screaming, but you're, you're not going to max out. You're never going to max with out. With that yeah. said, on my final mixes, especially for the web delivery and stuff where I'm mm -hmm. doing the final mix within Premiere Pro, right. I will often go to the track mixer, which is the master track mixer for everything. If you change one yeah. of the sliders globally, everything on that track will change by that amount. What I like to do is go to the master, the, the master actual output, and then I, I I open up the effects at the top. This is where I, where I add the hard limiter at the end, just to make yep. sure nothing clips. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that, you're basically making sure that no matter what happens in your mix, if you're in a time crunch or something and you don't want it to overload and modulate and distort, go to the track mixer, go to the last track, which is the master, go up top to the effects panel. And from here, you can choose your 
amplitude and compression and use hard limiter. And if you double click on it, it'll open up and there's presets at the top, which are great. What I'd like to do is limit it to three, minus three. So nothing will go higher than minus three, which is very aggressive, very loud, but there's still some headroom there. And the six dB, the, the default, it's adding six decibels to everything. That's way too much. Yeah, I'll either leave that. it at zero, so yes. everything just comes up. And sometimes yes. one, if I want to balance everything and compress it a little bit. But I would say just zero and minus three will ensure that your entire audio mix will never go higher than minus three. It'll never distort. And it's a safety valve. It's basically you're guaranteeing that someone won't get it on the other side and be like, it's distorting, it's too loud, it's hitting the red, bounce it back, do it again. Yeah. So what do you think and of this that? Is yeah, no. So hard, hard limiting on the on the master fader standard for film, standard for commercials, standard Ooh. for you know Spotify tracks, everything. It's it's yeah. part of the mastering chain, um, and it's an absolute necessity. And I absolutely use this. In fact, I'll use either that hard limiter or sometimes I'll just use the brick wall limiter component yeah. of the multi band compressor, which sure. is one of our native effects as well. But just the brick wall component, not not the compression side of it. Um, and yeah, this minus, isn't a minus three is actually kind of conservative. You can go to minus one and absolutely, really get, but really get it. But again, mm, I, yeah. I, 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 you know, I usually tell people don't bother. And there, and there's a reason too. Yes, you could set the hard limiter to minus one. You could set the hard limiter to minus 0. 0.5, like we talked about yesterday. Yeah. Your ear, your brain is not going to perceive a change in volume that's less than a dB and a half. So it, whether you hard limit to minus 1.5 or minus 0.5 or minus 0.25, it's not gonna sound any louder. You're not going right. to perceive any actual difference. So for safety's sake, and particularly, you know, and I know we'll talk about this at the end where we get to deliverables, if you're going out to an MP4, don't hard limit to minus 0.5 because you're compressed. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna compress that and those peaks, you're going to have little things that will that they will change, right? They will actually, you will have samples above minus 0.5. So using minus three, I mean, that's that that's that's kind of a good sta uh, starting point. Something else to keep in mind too with hard limiters, as Vashi was explaining before. Now remember, he's also treating the dialogue as he's going. So just because you've got everything going through the master and you're ensuring that your final output won't have anything clipped. If you've got stuff in the mix elsewhere that's already too loud, it could be distorting on its own. Like the, the clip itself could be distorting. So you need to treat that separately. Your output won't hit red, it won't go zero dB, but you have to be mindful that that's, that's only gonna make sure that the, that the final file doesn't you know, exceed a, a broadcast output limit or whatever, whatever it is. Um, totally. you, you gotta, you have to treat it along the way too. So there's, there's definitely a couple of steps, uh, in there. So, Hey, uh, great question actually related to this. So Victor, uh, Di Giovanni asks, do you prefer to do your clip based, uh, attenuations ducking versus automatic ducking, which we have in, uh, via the essential sound panel? That's a interesting conversation. Like I've always had to do it manually. It's right. great to have the essential sound, uh, panel to give me that automated option. It's, right. you know, not, it's, you know, within the last two or three years or even longer. Um, I was, I kind of get anal, like I like doing it manually to have the manual control. If I'm in a time crunch or it's something going to the web, then I'll absolutely use the ducking in the sound panel. But I prefer to do it by hand only because oftentimes with feature films, it's, it's a slightly more distinct. I have to be very precise and I like to see it myself and make the decisions, right? So if, yeah, if I'm a time crunch or something for the web, then I'll absolutely use the ducking to try and yep. get the nice flow going. Otherwise, I'll just do it manually. And that too, you know, and I, I, we've taught, I've seen you do this. If you're used to kind of, as Vashi said, riding the fader, like you're, you're, you're feeling it, right? You're feeling kind of the emotional connection of the music to the dialogue, to the scene. Then you, that that's, you can't replace that with an automated algorithm. Yeah. You know, there is, there, there's something about doing that manually. And then it's always editable anyway. So yeah. like to your point, quick, you got to do something real fast, but we need a quick thing for YouTube. Cool. Automatic duck is great. It'll do, it'll be close enough. But when you're really in it and you're trying to perfect it, if you're, if you're used to it and it's right, it takes time, but you can really feel it and you can really carve that space so perfectly. And just it's, it's a marriage of music and dialogue that really yeah. kind of brings the whole scene together. It's it, when you're doing it manually, it's like you're playing an instrument. 
you know, you're part of the process in, in the way it, that's how I feel because I'm, I'm helping it along and there's analog movements of the hand that digitally are, are, are created a different way, you know, like there's a give and take, it's like a Bezier, right? Like right. Exactly. ease into it, then come down. So there's like a rhythm to it. So there's a difference, but, um, should we go on to VFX and color and all that Absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. I think so. I'm, I'm checking to see. I'm an, I've been answering questions along the way here. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, but I'll, I'll plow through because we've already gone an hour. Wow. That's fast. Yeah. Shoot, I know, man. Time is uh, time is, is, is skipping away. <laughs> Ryan says, I like to live on the minus 0 0.1 edge. Yes. Oh, that's God. What a monster. That guy's a monster. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you can do it. And if you're staying uncompressed, like for your master, I still wouldn't go to minus 0.1, but theoretically, if you're, you know, if you're in a ProRes 444 with uh, uncompressed uh, PCM 24-bit audio, sure. Yeah. It'll retain minus 0.1. It'll be exact. No issue. But again, if you go to hand that off to be, you know, broadcast on Netflix or Hulu or somewhere, most likely they're not going to accept that. <laughs> totally. They're going to totally. tell you it needs to be attenuated. And that's the thing. Like the, Netflix has a like 60 page deliverable that I shared on Twitter for any of their original content. If they have a show on Twitter, it has to be 4K. It has to be cameras that they prescribe. 55 pages of deliverables that you have to adhere to and deliver to the final product to them. So if you think, just, oh, I'm going to mix it and just turn it over it's still a long road. You can yeah. completely finish everything and you're still not even started with the process. Right. Um, so let's go to color correction. Um, and color correction, let's talk real fast, very quickly. Color correction versus color grading. Color correction is the, is the act of balancing all the shots so they live in the same world. They're realistic. They have a white point um, you know, set. The white balance is set so it's neutral. You have some contrast, but you're not making creative coloring decisions yet. That's color grading. We're using color as an emotional tool to um, create an effect, an emotional effect into the footage to set a tone or to set a mood or to convey the message of the director and how it should visually look. Color correction is the first act. And when I, I've color graded nine feature films, I always go and do color correction first. I'll take every shot and balance it so it's working. Um, there's nothing worse than watching a, a short film or even a film and one shot just stands out where you're like, oh my God, what happened? Like those do squeak through. I've seen shows on TV and, you know, where a shot was not addressed or there was no LUT applied to it. And it was just like a flat log image. Um, so color correction is balancing everything so it all looks the same. Then color grading is adding that emotional component, that creative decision. So we're clear. And there is... A, um, a certain method. Like if you just go into color correction and start pushing dials around or doing stuff, that's not really the right way. These are the five steps that have worked for me. And I've talked to a lot of other color artists and they, you know, they're in the same boat and everyone has some differences, but set the white balance first, um, adjust the blacks. So they go down to zero and, you know, zero to a hundred is the range of IRE in, you know, in the space. And I just want to stick with color space 709 just to keep it simple because there's too many things going on. But you want to push the blacks down so they're almost to zero. Adjust the whites next so they're almost to the top to 100. Anything past 100 or at 100, it's pure white. And there's nothing that's really pure white in the real world. Like when I do text and stuff, I keep my text at like 90 or 92 right. for the white level. Because <laughs> nothing worse than 100 white when you see something on the screen. Mm -hmm. So keep it under 100. Keep the blacks at to taste down to zero. If you go past zero, you start crushing it and you're losing information. And then after you do the blacks and whites, adjust the mids where the face lives and the exposure. If you use the exposure, exposure slider that's in the essential, in the Lumetri, you'll be able to just move just the middle part. So you can open up the face, give it a little color, and then adjust saturation last so it falls within the, the realm. So that's like a quick overview of how I approach it. And I'll show you how I do a shot in a, in a minute. But this is something to keep in mind so you're not just randomly doing dials and hoping that you come across something that looks natural. It doesn't usually work that way. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, you agree, or what are you? Oh, thinking? absolutely, dude. You're absolutely hundred percent. I was going to say, yeah, let's <laughs> let's get into it. I can't wait to see you show some of that. So that's brilliant. Okay. Then let's yeah. pick. We got Howling Wolves. I'm just going to pick one of these shots from here, from yeah. Six Below. All right, and I'm going to be. I'm going to let you drive for a second. I will be right back. Okay. All right.
you know what, let's use this wolf while we're here. And I'll try it, let me make it bigger. And I'm gonna do my Lumetri, I like turning my scopes on and my Lumetri panel. I use Lumetri panel all the time. Like I found that it, it consists of like, you know, six different panels that we can use. <laughs> and let's find it here first. Lumetri color, where's it hiding? I think it's over here. There we go. So if everyone's familiar with Photoshop and, and just the sliders and stuff, it, it's it's kind of, you know, it, it's simple. I used to use three-way color wheels all the time, but I just found it easier to get into this here. Let me just highlight the shot. Any shot that I highlight in the timeline will, will activate the Lumetri panel. So give me one sec. There it is. So now it's on. So we're going to work on this wolf. You saw the other stuff that we shot in this in this series. It's, it's already like, you know, it's darker during the day. We shot this day for night, but it was really blustery. And when we shot the wolf, the wolf was completely in, you know, normal sunlight and stuff. So it doesn't match at all. Um, let me just get rid of this for one sec. We got too many vetroscopes. Wait for me. So... First thing I want to do is, is balance the, you know, color balance it. So on this example, we're kind of going to do both, both like color grading and color balancing. Right now it's pretty nice. Like nothing's black, nothing's blown out and nothing is hitting pure white. So that's kind of good, but definitely we want to get it to a more, you know, bluer looking style. So just the temperature, adjusting the white balance is a quick way. And I'm literally just going to eyeball this, you know, that looks more green. So I can add a little green into it to get it closer. And then, so that's looking already within like five seconds, I've gone from this orange tinted daytime stuff to something that's daytime or more nighttime. Um, and like I said, if I want to crush the blacks and bring them down, I'll use a black slider first. If you're looking at the scopes at the bottom left, as soon as it hits the bottom there, if I go further, it starts piling up and I'm crushing it. So I want to push it down to just barely touching. Then I'll go to the whites. And same thing, I don't want them all the way to the top, I just want them underneath. And since it's nighttime, I'll go even lower to like about here, 90 or 80. And then exposure is the middle, and this will help me either bring out the wolf or, or not. And I just want to match the, the previous shot. And then saturation is last, where again, to taste, like that doesn't look like nighttime. If I back it off and just mute it a little bit and bring down the exposure, and then I look at it and compare it to that. Now it looks like those are living in the same world. Now it looks like this wolf is chasing Josh Hartnett as opposed to this wolf who looks like he's having a picnic in the park and that doesn't <laughs> live in the same world. So, I mean, you could see that I didn't have to go to the color wheels and do all this stuff. You can. Yeah. I've done that so many times. I literally love using the sliders as long as I use the approach of blacks first to set the bottom, whites next to set where the top end is, exposure in the middle to tweak that. And then if I want to add contrast or less, then I can use a contrast slider to just back it off a bit or crush it more. But I always follow my scopes in the bottom left to make sure what I'm doing is represented by that because you will get eye fatigue. You will look at a shot all day long and be like, that looks great. And then you'll compare it to the previous shot and you're like, it's not in the same world at all. So use your scopes, they're your best friends. Don't worry about, oh, I need a Flanders monitor, this, that, or the other thing. Use the scopes that are built in and get it really close. If you're delivering the, the actual color grade, super. If someone else is going to do it, help them with what the intent is and they'll take it the rest of the way. So that's the easiest way to do this. And a little trick I use all the time for dramatic moments, like even this one, um, like this is the raw red footage. So I would just bring the blacks down lower to give it a little more nighttime look. I would, then I would add a vignette. I love going to the vignette, which is the last option in the stack under Lumetri Color. And then I drop the vignette. It adds a cinematic darkening of the corners. It looks like an anamorphic lens. It focuses your eye to the middle of the screen on Josh. And once again, like in five seconds, I go from this daytime shot that it, it looks impressive, snow's blowing, but I have this really dramatic shot. And if it got too dark with the, with the vignette, then all I do is go back here and I bring up the exposure in the middle to compensate for that because I still keep the dark corners, but he pops a little bit more. And then same thing, saturation. If I pump it up 
it'll make it look better. But I mean, the fact that I can go from from that to, to that, oh, it's yeah. a little more cinematic in my eye. You're it's very drawn cinematic. to the middle, right? Yeah, that took 20 it, seconds. So dude, it look it's so significant. It's like it's so dramatic too. And you didn't even make that many changes. That's nope. what's I think that's what's inspiring about this is that yeah. Again, like the fact that you just said, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have to touch the color wheels. You didn't have to go into curves. Nope. You can. That's a great shot, right? That's a great shot, but it's la on the edges. You're my eyes drawn to the outside, and it's right. out of contrast. Right. And then I literally did that. And if I would just add, you know, it's just so quick, and that looks just badass. Like I'm like, yeah, I want to see that badass. movie. You know. So hey, so just on yeah, that, so Ryan was just asking since you were talking about reds. Um, how do yeah. you handle red files? Says usually input. Rec 709 LUTs are set in Lumetri as the technical LUT, yes. but Red's Rec 709 LUTs are output LUTs, so they're supposed to go at the end. Yeah. How do you deal um, with this? In in editorial, um, I'm just trying to balance everything. So I will use the LUTs that are provided and I'll just balance the image. I'm not usually color grading like on, on this. You're this is a red file yet. here and I'm just mm -hmm. you know, throwing it around. I'll just use what was given to me. I mean, sometimes I get, obviously I prefer to not have transcodes and proxies. Like so I'm editing 6K footage. This is what we're doing right now. This is a 6K red raw file. It's not a transcode. It's not a, you know, quick time. So I would just apply, give, use what they give me and then tweak as needed just to keep the intent right and the color is, let him worry about the technical LUTs, the creative LUTs, the, the, the pass through and all that kind of stuff. My job is just to get it close and just to get it, you know, up on its feet. And there should be a LUT that comes with it. I mean, you shouldn't. You should be able to have some kind of just seven or nine LUT dropped on it for editorial. Yep, makes sense. Awesome. Um, so that's so that's just a quick color, like you know, that's just one shot, and you know, the same thing here. We already did that, and even with the wolf, you just throw a little vignette on, and it just it's a little more dramatic, and. Same thing, compensate, a little more exposure, so he pops a little bit more. But it just, you know, when you're given this shot and you're like, that that's okay or whatever, but you see that, you're like a wolf in the daytime. And then you're like, you know, dramatic wolf. So, so good. So you got a couple questions here about yes. um, Lumetri scopes. And maybe you could show, uh, you've got, so you've got three or you got four, four I scopes. I pushing buttons. I got to get rid of some of these. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so actually you can just leave that right click menu open for a sec. So Okay. So what, so what are those, what are the scopes you normally use when I you're use, doing like this kind of work? I sometimes forget the names because I'm right. No, there's so, well, that's just it. We have, we have a lot of them. So yeah. Parade. You've right. got the parade, like you have your histogram, you have your YUV, uh, you have HLS. Yeah. I use two. I use two and I'm trying to find the right two. I use this so I can see the red, green, blue. RGB which will help parade, me color yeah. Correct. And then Classic. I'll use the set. What's the saturation? Um, the vetroscope. The so a, I want to get rid HSL of the, vectroscope. I want to get rid of that. I want to use the vetroscope just so I can see the. Yeah, I'll yeah. use I use these two, and I can choose. Um, I like the brightness to be bright. Yeah. So on the left here, this is showing breaking down the red, green, and blue of this image of the wolf. There's a lot of blue. There's a lot of green. Not much red. So you can see by the height of everything, and also. This is 100 IRE. So we're dealing with this is pure white, this is pure black. Mm -hmm. So this is a great representation. If I wasn't looking at that wolf shot, I would say this shot is tinted very blue green and in, you know, probably nighttime, judging by the right. levels. I can look right. at a waveform and tell you basically what the image is and you uncover it. I can also mm -hmm. color grade from just a waveform without seeing the image. If you told right. me to white balance this, then I would go with I would hide that. I would go into the probably the I'd go into curves. Yeah, I was trying to probably use curves there. Yeah. I would go, I would bring down the blues. So the blues actually come down in the graph. I would then grab the greens, bring them down from the highlights. Once all three of those columns are all the same, then you're white balanced. And that's yep. like a trick most people don't know, or yeah. if you're not a colorist. So just by doing this, where I'm, hold on, I'm just trying to grab, my mouse is biting me. I think it's wanting you to add a point just before yeah, the title. So, so real fast, all I did was make the tops of these red, green, blue the same. And then if I look at my image, that's pretty white balanced. So I didn't have to, awesome. I didn't have to look <laughs> it's, it's so great. And actually, it's funny because, of course, you've got the white balance eyedropper and the basic controls sure. there. But sure. But I, I want to say you may have even have shown me that technique years ago when I was terrified of touching curves. Yeah. Um, and you said, you know, that's the thing. If you use the RGB parade... Yep. You can, and this is before we had the white balance eyedropper. It, I remember we didn't have it initially in Lumetri. 
this is something you recommended doing and it, it saved me a million times. Yeah, it's so I great. learned that from, I think Stu Mashewitz in one of his books. Mm -hmm. or books oh, showed, yes. You know, he, the rebel guide. You know, yeah, whatever. oh yeah. He just said like, just make these three the same and it's white no matter what, you don't have to look at the image. And so if I turn right. off the RGB curves, we're back here, you can see right. blue, green, red. I turn it on, it took me what, 15 seconds to adjust? And then I can go back, and this one here is the saturation. This is not saturated. If this is the boundary line of saturation, if you cross these, mm -hmm. this hexagon, pentagon, hexagon, what is it? Hexagon. If you pass the lines of these edges, you're going to go into like uh, out of bounds for for broadcast. So right. if I go back to basic correction, then just bump up the saturation. I can add some information there, and you can see it's all within the boundaries. So it's more exaggerated. That's a very stylistic shot. Now if I turn the curves back off oh no i never mind i now i'm uh, out in the wilderness but um rgb curves oh never mind that's right oh my god too many options <laughs> there we go okay so yeah so i would just use i use this and this to do my color grading and for analyzing shots and figuring out what's going on very nice Okay, so, so um, oh, and I was ahead. just, um, I was just going to ask gonna, you something. I'm going to reset to the same time. Like, okay, go. back to somewhat normal. The color is, it's funny. It's looking, it's looking so good on there. I just, I'm sorry, I was just answering another question here. Oh and I no, just you're got your hands full. Let me, while you're dealing with that, let me do this. Um, <laughs> since we did color correction, co order of operations. This is straight up Stu Mashewitz. This is like godsend. So. When you're thinking about, you know, you finish your color grade, you're looking at your, your project, you're like, how do I approach color grading and whatnot? There is an order of operations that will maintain the integrity of your footage and will give you the best results on the way out. You can't just willy nilly. You can't be like, all right, throw a LUT on, let's add grain and then a vignette later and then a power window. This is the correct order that, you, that I recommend, that I use, and I love my results. So you know, take a screen cap or follow this, denoise your stuff, then do color correction, add your power windows or masks or, you know, whatnot, your gradients, lens, filter effects, then vignettes, then the grade itself, LUTs, film grain will always last. And then you can resize the image for export. If you're starting with 6K and you're delivering a 2K DCP, you would do that now, and then sharpen and soften it as to taste. And I find this to be really helpful. Um, and it just gives me, it gives me not, it's not constraints. It's just an order, which I know will give me both technically and creatively like a proper result. And I'm sure there's other ways to do it. I'm sure some amazing colorists have their own method. That's fine. I've just had really good results with this and just wanted to share it with everyone and try and, you know, to show you, you know, what's going on. So this is actually perfectly timed because it, it, it sparked my, <laughs> it reignited the thought that I lost because that's what happens when you enter the second decade of life. Oh um, uh, which is, so in talking about when we were looking at the scope a moment ago and talking about kind of, you know, in particular saturation. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's a big trend, which you see on, you know, on YouTube, especially, you know, any sort of, you know, consumer produced video, but these can be to the masses where saturation in particular and vibrance absolutely pushed beyond those limits, right? Where just yeah. red are red, you yeah. know. And, this is and, bigger. And, we can see this now. If you, right, hit, yeah, there you go. Yeah. if you hit these boxes, then you're out of bounds. If you get you're this out of far, you're literally broadcast. Whatever you send them, they'll kick it back and say it's it's so, over oversaturated. So the question is, though, right? So as yeah. I was saying, so right. So in a broadcast environment, or again, like Netflix, Hulu, sure, they're going to bounce it immediately. Oh my of course, God, YouTube, yeah. YouTube, other places don't care. Free and when we're talking yeah. about consumption, it's like it does grab you, right? When something is yeah. so vibrant unnervingly so you, you are kind of drawn to it so do you, do you have any just thoughts on that in terms of because i i always kind of lean towards well keep it keep it kind of within the limits because you never know what it's being viewed on you know something might look extremely red on this screen and a bit more muted on this screen that's the thing i've heard from other people that an ipad has like the ideal um right access or, or output if it right. looks good on an ipad it's going to look pretty good on everything else like it's like a very well calibrated device so because of the heard, nature of the retina screen or whatever. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's always a good starting point. I I use I love my Dell. I have a I have the 8K Dell monitor at home, which is unbelievable. Like I can see pixel for pixel, and I have the 49 mm -hmm. inch. 
and they're all calibrated extremely well and you get very close to you know optimal if you have a, a most monitor a professional monitor within the last two or three years they're going to get you like 95 percent of the way there i know people that grade on these things they don't go to a suite they grade on right. consumer models or prosumer models for a thousand dollars you can get an amazing monitor and you know no one's going to argue with you or, or fight you and say oh it's not professional if it looks good just like audio if it sounds good it is good if it looks good it's good like i prefer um the color grades that are kind of till not tinted towards one color but like that's like monochromatic like david fincher on like uh mindhunters likes to go monochromatic where it's kind of like orangey across everything there's contrast you know and stuff i like the tints you know my that way something that doesn't look like real life like i like the grades that look like a movie whatever that may be and that definition of a movie is different for every person but i like those cinematic looks that don't look like just me looking down or looking out the window or walking down the street, yep. you know, yeah. an mm -hmm. escapist view is what and I like again, to see. You're, you're, you're touching upon that, you know, uh, that concept of there's, there are emotional connections to color and light. Yeah. Right. Totally. And there's, and, and you have to, and there's, there's no, there's no right or wrong, but it's, it's like, you're saying like what you prefer and how, what you, what you, conceive of what people like generally people kind of accept is right. These, these different stylistic type colors that make you yeah. feel a particular way or bring you into a certain mood or with a certain aesthetic, it can, it can change everything. Right. Very quickly. Totally. totally. Awesome. Um, so going on to like VFX and stuff in premiere pro, what I wanted to demo here was, let me drop this down so I can see better. Um, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of things happening with split screens. Lately, and uh, you know, again, David Fincher has been doing this for 15 years. In Final Cut 7, they were doing it in Social Network. They've been doing it in Premiere Pro, especially. And we have some amazing options that I love to use. And splitting the screen is something that you can affect the performance. If you have two actors, one on each side of the screen, you can literally split the screen and use different takes or speed up one side of the performance to match the other one. Um, if there's a huge pause between dialogue, you can close that gap by making this person talk faster or say their line earlier. So you're not locked into what was captured in the camera. Right. And the secret behind it is shooting with an oversized sample capture, like shooting at 8K and then framing it in 4K. And then you have all this room to stabilize. So if there is any movement in different takes with the camera, that's gone. It's locked in and these two shots are locked. Um, that's great for dialogue and stuff. In Six Below, I had the chance with this shot, and you might not hear me while I play it, but just like a five second shot. But there's a shot here where Josh is, he fell in the water, he's freezing, he's trying to dry himself off, and he's, it's a compliment, like he's a in his head kind of moment, and I'll just play it real fast. So he's just sitting there, you know, by the, by the seashore or whatever, lake shore. And I was like, you know what, this is like, I can make this into an interesting moment. So what I did was I did a split screen. Uh, um, I rock and rolled his four second clip and I'll show you what that means. And then I sped mm -hmm. up the sky. So I created a split screen where the bottom half is in real time and the top half is playing at like 600%. So right. hopefully it'll play back here. So just yeah. watch the, the performance. Oh, and right at right at that moment, yeah, your your Wi-Fi chunk. Since watch the sky, so here I'm in the clouds and the sky, and it's kind of like you know, it's surreal. Yeah, it's surreal. Um, let me see if I can play it. My computer's smoking up, but um, so you can see like it's one shot, but I split it, through. and so the sky's moving and he's moving. Okay. Yeah, it's coming so through. It shot, looks good. The way I did that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I know it's hard. It's hard to see because we're doing six K passing it on. But what I did was, and you can see here, I'll show you. I took the four second clip here. It starts here, ends here. The next clip, I reversed it. So it starts in the last frame, goes to the first frame. Then I did the normal shot again, and then I did the reverse shot again. So it's called rock and roll. It's basically when the sand people, when they catch Luke on top of the, of the mountain there, and he knocks, the sand person knocks over Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, and his hands go up and he goes, arr, arr, arr. So that's the same oh, yeah. clip being played forward and backward, forward and backward to get more out of that one moment. 
So I did the same thing here. He sits down, he's looking around, so it plays for four seconds, then I reverse it, so it starts in the same last frame, goes back to the first frame, and then I repeat it again. So I get like 10 seconds out of a three second shot. And the way I did the split screen was, I'll just do it from scratch over here since we have the situation. First thing you do is you wanna copy the, the shot, um, alt, drag, and I'll make a copy of the shot above it. Um, we used to have to do split screens and stuff by adding a crop feature, or a crop effect, but now we don't have to because we can use the opacity of the actual shot. If I double click on the shot to load it into my broad source, if I go down to opacity, I'm gonna to choose to free draw the, the clip. The one thing I have to do is back off on the size of the clip so I can see the edges because I'm gonna to have to draw outside the frame edge. So let's go to 100. Okay, so I'm gonna use the opacity under the clip, the actual source clip, hit the free draw, and I will follow the edges of this tree line in the hill. And I'm gonna go all the way across and then outside the edges. And once I close it by touching the first point, oh God, did I do it? Yeah, you got it. I did, okay. First try. So, first try, <laughs> scary. So I have this on the top clip. I'm gonna turn off the bottom clip right now and you'll see the top clip is only this. So let me make it bigger and I can do, now I can do fit. So I drew a mat around him and this is not being shown. So it's just this part of the clip that's active. That's the top clip. Now in the bottom clip, no, actually I'll just, And now, well, it takes a while. I don't want to waste everyone's time. But what I did was I take the other clip and I sped it up to, you can see here, 600%. And if it's, I'll close it here. I'll just show you. And I'll do fit. So you can see the whole shot is now playing at 600% on this side. And so when, if I take it and I'll just copy this. So I'm just taking the regular clip, 600%. I'll drag it underneath. And then I have the mask here and I'm gonna invert it. And I gotta, well, I gotta turn that layer on. Sorry, I didn't have the opacity on. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not used to the, the monitor, or, I'm sorry, the 17 inch, I've been on literally the big boy screens. So now I have real time at the bottom and I have the looped sky going 600%, you can see here. So. Josh is just moving normal, and the background is going really, really fast. And it's just a kind of, you know, a surreal effect that you can do quickly. And that's how I like using masks right there. And obviously, you could just do this nice. for two people talking in real time, and then adjust each side of the performance. But I just wanted to show you a more creative way to get a cool result. Okay. Um, so we're, you're back to sounding like the Borg for some reason now. It's, your, your internet's been kind of chunking a little. Uh, it's funny, the video is playing just fine. Can we do a quick little sound check again for you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You're just, it's very. It's terrible. Yeah. Let me just check Let's one see if it change. You check one, two. Yeah, still, still doing it. Let's see if we can just change the input real quickly to that. Uh, the, uh, what is it? The mic? Yeah, like the native mic. Is that worse? No, it's clean, actually. That's it's fine. Let's stick, yeah, let's stick with that, that for okay? now. Okay. Yeah. You just talk to me. Oh, and now we just lost your sound. <laughs> what is happening today? That one works. Now we're back. Okay. Sorry, but right. I guess this. Now we're not the Borg anymore. Yeah, I don't know what's okay. going on. It's, That's weird. It's, I, I think it's yeah. It's just it's one of those things, man. We're live. Yeah, we're right. streaming. The world is streaming, and it happens. But you that's know, right. It's okay. To have you back. All right. Nice. So what I wanted to do next was like that's you know an example of within Premiere Pro normal stuff. We're gonna get to that in a minute. Don't worry. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> but what I wanted to show was. Uh, 
was, you know, in After Effects, how we can bounce around with dynamic link. And I had this shot here and people always ask, you know, how do you, how do you dynamic linking and why, what's the benefit of it? And I always mm -hmm. say that if you can gain access to the power of After Effects, and if you do have a, a visual effects editor or an assistant that can do VFX, I can keep editing in Premiere Pro, send my shot over to After Effects, someone else can work on it and replace it in my timeline and I can look at it and give notes and stuff. In the old days, as you know, if I wanted to do an effect shot with this clip that's up right now, I would have to export a QuickTime, import that into Premiere, sorry, into After Effects, do the work, export another QuickTime from After Effects, import that one back into Premiere Pro. So I'm making all these files, taking all this time, and that's really not effective. And I know David Fincher during Gone Girl said, can we link dynamically to After Effects? And, you know, there was born a, a functionality that I think I, I use every day on every project. And um, I'll just show you how, how we do that. Um, I use it all the time. So mm -hmm. same thing. Any effects that we're doing, both audio or visual, just make a copy of your original clip first. You never want to work with without that. You always want to have the master there always. And Jason, you can hear me, right? Oh, yeah. Everything. Okay, cool. Then I right click and go replace with After Effects composition. So I'm sending this duplicate clip into After Effects. And what happens is it actually opens an After Effects and it turns it into an After Effects composition that lives inside Premiere Pro. So it's a its own standalone file that lives outside. And that means anyone else in my team can open it up, play with it, work it, do whatever they want. I'll just call it Josh Face for whatever reason. Okay, so we have this clip. Um, for the sake of Making it easy, I'm going to do bulge, and I'm going to scroll forward till his face comes up here, and I'm going to put the bulge on his face, center it there, and do bulge height, and it just I'm just doing an effect so we see that something is happening. So we're making a ridiculous big face, Josh. That's not what he looks like. So now he he's you know he stepped up to camera. And he's got a big balloon head. Um, and now if I switch back to Premiere Pro, in my timeline, that is now living here. This is now living in my Premiere Pro timeline. And I can do lots of effects that I can't do in Premiere Pro. Having access to like either third-party plugins or more intricate compositions, I can send it there and come back. And any updates will always be updated in Premiere Pro. So right now, someone else could be in After Effects working make changes and all I got to do is come back here and say, Oh, that's great. Or make his face less balloon like, you know, right. whatever, <laughs> right. which would be nice. Um, right. The best part about all this though, is, is if I sign off on the shot, I'm like, great, it's perfect. This is still connected to after effects and it does take a hit processing. If you have 200 shots in after effects open via, via dynamic link, it's going to affect your performance. Um, if you right click and you hit render and replace, I can change this After Effects composition into a QuickTime file of my choice yep. of any flavor I want. So I'll say individual clips. I'm just going to say just this one clip. I want to change it into a ProRes 422. Um, put it next to my original media. That's fine. I don't want handles. If you do have handles, it'll create extra frames in case you want to make subtle adjustments on either side. And then when you hit OK, it will look at this red file that's living in After Effects. It'll convert it into a QuickTime 422 ProRes that I called out for. It'll put it in my in my project next to the original footage. Yep. And it won't be having a direct link to After Effects anymore. It will take that processing hit away and be like, we're all good. So it might take a bit because it's, it's like a 12 second clip and it's 6K and we're adding bulbous right, right. heads to it. <laughs> so bottom line is, when it finishes in your timeline, you have a standalone QuickTime file that will also live in your bin. So it's completely separate file. It's now in your project and you now have that rendered out and you can use that as an export file you know, when you need to. And the mm -hmm. best part is if it finishes rendering is if, for example, you're like, you know what? We have to make one more change. You can right click on that QuickTime file in your timeline and change it back into an After Effects project. Yep. Go back and make a change. So it's completely fluid. You can lock it in as an After Effects. You can make it a QuickTime file, but you can always go back. You're never, it's never set in concrete, which is to yep. me the biggest, like awesome. Yeah, thing. 
it's it's sense. huge. And actually, I see there's a lot of people. In fact, Uma Corrin was just commenting that previously. Sorry, I'm talking so much. Oh no, no, dude, what, are you kidding? Uh, Uma Corrin was saying that uh, that uh, Dynamic Link had been crashing, but now with a newer setup, it, it's probably better. And that's the truth: is that we've made a lot of improvements, yes. speed improvements, processing improvements to how that works. And as Vashi pointed out right up front, you do take a hit because you're 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 feeding one app through the other and they're 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 connected. The difference is is that if you decide, oh, I need to do some quick effects, visual effects, whatever it is that you can't do natively in Premiere, it's a it's a right click control click operation. And yep. then once you get what you want, right, you can stay, you know, I, I think one of the things that a lot of people run into on underpowered systems is because you can create any number of dynamic links. Yeah. So if you've got you know, in your case, let's there say a dozen of these, oh, yeah, and it's done. You got a dozen of these running uh, on 6K footage. Oh, you know, that's, that's a right. Hit. It's a hit. So now we just did look through this. It's 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 coming through fluidly, beautifully over the so stream. Look at that. So I'm not. I don't have to render it. It's actual QuickTime in 6K. I got double right. 6K <laughs> right. footage. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. And you know what? The render wasn't it wasn't so bad. And we're on no. a laptop too. Let's we're remember. on a laptop. That shot is you know eight seconds long, six K, adding bulbous head. And like I said, so now it's a QuickTime file that lives in my bin, in my master project right here. You can see it shows me this is the file mm -hmm. in all its aspects. And if I want to make any changes, I right click and say restore unrendered, and it'll change it back into an After Effects project there. So I'm completely fluid that way. Nice. And um, since I'm in After Effects, someone was asking yesterday, we were talking about, uh, you know, how to use After Effects and whatnot. So there's a shot I wanted to show you. Uh, this is how intricate I will save that. Yes. So this shot is, Arctic Joe's fine. This shot is the, the later version of that where he comes in where we added, again, I don't know if you'll hear me if I hit play, but I just want to, let me just hit play and see what happens. All right. Yeah, we're definitely not hearing you for whatever reason. Yeah, no, yeah, no worries. It's I didn't render it out. But what I wanted to show was this is we did goggle replacement we were talking about yesterday. Oh, right. In, in the raw right. footage, there was not all this snow. The crew was visible right here in the goggles. You know, right. we added all this stuff. And I wanted to show you just the composition, the layer of how many layers there are to right. make that happen. So you can see here. You know, this is the roto shield and you can turn things on and off and you'll see the difference in the actual image. So there's, you know, whatever, 24, 23 layers in this one shot. <laughs> so this shot was started in Premiere Pro, sent over, all this work was done. And then I got the master shot back. I got this shot back um, with all the effects added to it. Nice and so that's just applied and yeah. yeah. And you can see all everything, <laughs> snow, rampant Ramp 5K snow everywhere. And that's the final shot and it all clean as a whistle. And and we had to pop him out as well. So that's the level of you know intricacy some shots take. And when you see them, they just look normal and natural. You're like, oh, that's a nice shot. So it's that's all After Effects. And, but it started right. in Premiere Pro and got sent over. Nothing, nothing is real, as John Lennon once nothing, said. Nothing. You, never, you never know anymore with uh, strawberry with the fields world. forever, my friend. That's right. <laughs> I play the. I already turned the flutes off. I'll bring them back for the end. Nice. So yeah, um, no, that's amazing. And you know that's. Again, I think that's one of those things where in in especially in the in the work in the workflow that you're kind of discussing here describing, you could have uh, someone else working on this in After Effects and you know, you're working off of either it doesn't have to be even shared projects, but shared media, shared elements. Yes. You bring it back in, this is all going to work and link up for you and it just it makes your life as the as yeah. the editor so much easier. You still can always go back to that original shot with the crew reflected in the glasses. I mean, um, there's just a lot of flexibility and you don't have to worry. Yeah, that's anything. here. You, you can yeah. see. Yeah, do that's fit. so great. You can see right there. Let me do. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see all the bodies right there. <laughs> but that's so you good. You can see the crew right here. So all that's, you know, we can't have that. So it's funny. Yeah. That's so good. Oh, whatever. So uh, um, Renzo Ortiz just asked, um, do you do color grading before or after visual effects? Um, usually after it's like the last step because 
I will send my shot as needed to VFX. They'll do it as early as possible. Color grading is basically the glue that holds the visuals together. It has to be put on everything. You can't color grade and add a VFX shot because right. it has to be blended together. It's like when you put an adjustment layer over everything in your timeline and add a LUT to it. It's going to affect everything underneath it. It's the last thing you do. Um, you wouldn't put like a – because even VFX, if you put – um, an explosion or a spark or something. It's that color right. is not going to blend in the right. world. It's, it's not going to match, right? It's not going right. to blend into the world you're seeing. Yeah. Getting a lot of love for this, this glass replacement, by the way, the goggles replacement, people are oh. freaking out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing. It has to happen. Like, you know, you can't have the crew just staring there. The cameraman's like five feet away. It would just look right. ridiculous. How so common it, is is the, like something like something like this? I mean, I guess it involves glass, but even just glasses can reflect these things too. I mean, oh, I imagine yeah. this is probably done a lot. This particular yes. technique that you're showing here, it's done and a lot. Yeah, and, and what they do, like you saw there, they outline the, the glasses, they track it with mocha, they replace it with either uh, other footage or try and like you know neutralize it so it's like one solid color. Right, like solid the best color, ones yeah. actually show the opposite view where they film right. the, the other direction and they and they pop that into the goggles. Right. But again, that's time, you know, labor intensive and time. Right. Compulsive. And it also depends in, in the context of story and how long it's on screen. You know, if it's, if it's a half a second. Yeah. Are you going to notice, right? I mean, that, that ultimately I imagine dictates a lot of how to what extremes you're going to kind of replace that and change it. Right. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, so that's VFX. Let's go. Can I go jump to deliverables? Cause we have yeah, you know, so yeah, 15 we've got, minutes we've got or 10 minutes. minutes. Man. We got nine minutes. Okay, and I'll I'll do this because this is here. Number one, <sighs> never send something out until you've checked it like three times, and then even then, like have someone else eyeball it. There's nothing worse feeling than you send something to your director producer, and there's like a mistake or something glaring that you're like, oh my god, I I should have seen that, or why didn't I see that? Right. So just take the extra time before you post anything. It gets your it's your reputation on the line at that point. You know, it's. Mm -hmm. It has your name. Your name is stamped on that deliverable or that asset or that version. So do what you want, but just know that that, that will be associated with you. So take that seriously. Um, I thought this was cool. We shot six below in 6K. And so this is the full image here, the top right. That's the 6K image we captured. This is the 4K extraction for theatrical. So we threw away the outside edges because we had to have this 276 um, sizing. So I had to resize every, the film. So basically like cut the film once for full image, once for this. And this is the Barco escape format, which is three screens in a theater, three full size movie screens. So we also had a version where it was cropped this way. That's why we shot at 6k to be able to deliver all the different sizes of the final film for the different formats and ex exhibitions. And that's, you know, that's the image. So it was cool. It was tough because I had to cut the film twice, basically, because right. I had to reframe everything, you know, for the second version. And this is, you know, we had to deliver 14 different formats for the actual end of the film. You can see on the left, again, the full size raster, the, the 4K, the 4K with the 276, the barcode escape and the stretched one. So these are just examples of some of the final deliverables from our source material. And I believe that's the final timeline. So it gets crazy because you have to have, we made custom presets using Adobe Media Encoder to be able to go and um, create these. So we didn't have to keep creating presets. Right. Um, and they actually, it's just an image of it. These are you know, 10 or 12 of the presets. They're actually in the document. They're in the PDF um, that is available that I'll put up at the end. And they're different formats, different sizes, different requirements, some for review, some for DCPs. And it's amazing just to have the presets all within the ecosystem where Premiere Pro is the hub. I go to After Effects to do my VFX. I go to Audition to do my audio work as needed. I can create a DCP internally. I can make any format I want. We did DPX to send to the colorists. We had a series of obviously images, 6K images that went to get colored. So it's a there's so much technical behind the scenes to make the creative happen. And it is a complete, again, a dance. Like we were talking about earlier with the audio and the video, the creative and the technology goes hand in hand to try and achieve the storytelling and emotional goal. And um, one last one is like this. These are just some of the deliverable sizes 
like you start in a format and you have to deliver in a, in a size. We know, I love aspect ratios, you know, oh, yes. two, two, two to zero or two to, two to one is so popular now on TV, which is in between widescreen and the old 16 by nine. And these are like numbers that keep popping up like in my dreams at night. I'm like, what was the size of that? Hold on, 22,000 pixels by, right. oh my God. So I had to write it down. I had to write Ultimate it down. Surgery so right there. Hey, yeah. by the way, it's worth yes. pointing out that on your site, this is one of the many, many free offerings. So you have oh, a yeah. whole series of pre-created um, aspect ratio mats that you oh, can yeah. apply. So yeah. you so can just, that'll... you got them in to, in HD, 2K, 4K, UHD, right? So yes. if you want to create a 2.76 to one look on your existing 16.9 HD footage, Vashi's already made, you know, already the, made the yeah. lighter box. Go to my website and grab yeah. it. Just look up white, like Vashi widescreen, or I'll put a link to it, or it's all in there. But it, it's nice to have because then you can, it's amazing what a widescreen mat will, how it changes emotionally, how you see something. You can just shoot something, even with your iPhone. If your iPhone sideways, capture 4K at 16 by 9, put a 2.4 2 mat or 276, and you're like, whoa, look at that. It's just, it just changes it so instantly. Yeah. By the way, now this is uh, kind of along the same topic, but um, a couple of people were saying that some of the uh, presets, some of the audio presets from one of your collections yeah. there, some are showing up as obsolete. And I just wanted to talk to that for a second. Yeah, Jason, um, why did you make them obsolete? I yes. got to redo them? <laughs> it's not me. I can redo uh, them. That's yes. So yeah, so, all, so the reason you're seeing some of that is that they were made in effects that we've either since removed or 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 just revamped or changed or replaced so, so i gotta i'll just all right, update them. i'll update them next week and use yeah, the new so that's so that's why if you go back to you know two that's nine years ago when i posted premiere, those presets seven versions ago of premiere yeah. uh yes then that's but that's why you're seeing that and by the way even a project from a couple of years ago we've we've changed a lot of the effects and things noise reduction being one of them now there's not the denoiser not the the previous one that was the the, the one that we used to use so Yes, th that that's why. But otherwise, so now you know. Okay. Uh, also, a couple people are asking too about um, using uh, After Effects for things like content aware to fix things in shots. And Jan Eric was pointing out. So you remember the in Game of Thrones last year, where you know there was that shot that had the Starbucks cup in it. Yeah. Which um, I'm proud to say uh, uh, I, I removed the cup in that shot. And then that's one of our little posts on our Adobe social that kind of went viral for, you know, yeah. 14 minutes and 38 seconds. Um, and the question was, how come, how, how did no editor notice that? How did people just not see that there was, Cause this... it was too dark. <laughs> Cause they're in a totally dark room watching yeah. with, <laughs> with just absolute extremes of color and, and light. Yeah, no, nah, it's true. It's so funny. And there and then there was another one right weeks later with like the it was like a, um, water, a water, water bottle or something. Yeah, water yeah. bottle. Yeah. That. Oh, it's too funny. That's that's, too that's good. no, it's crazy. And as editors, I'm sure everyone's done it. You watch the same cut that you've done so many times that you're just completely numb to everything. And the most glaring mistake is right there. And someone will walk in the room and be like, why is there a Starbucks uh, thing right there? And you didn't even see it. So it's understandable. It's not the editor's fault. There's so many layers and, and of people that it has to go through. So it's oh, just yeah. one of those one of those things. So hey, so we're in our last three minutes here. So I'm gonna feed you a couple questions. Okay. Uh, we've got Philip Harvey who's asking, do you handle various audio mixes on your deliverables? So things like combination of stereo, five one, seven one. I will have to deliver that. Like most of the time when we screen, if we're doing a feature film, we screen in DCPs now. So I'll have to have like a 5-1 mix. The director will ask for it because we're going to show in a theater that is a 5-1, you know, proper theater. So right. I won't, I'll do a stereo mix, but I'll also have a 5-1 mix. Um, it's easier to build in 5-1 because then you can export a mix down to stereo right. and a 5-1. And right. the DCP can hold both. So if you're in a theater that only has stereo, you know, front, you know, whatever, center, left, right. Great. Mm -hmm. You have that version of audio and you also have a 5-1. And the 5-1, even if I build it out roughly, it does play great in a theater. It does that immersive audio soundscape does help mm -hmm. the picture. It helps, yep. you know, solve problems. It makes it feel bigger. So right. that does fall on the editor these days. And it's all mm -hmm. about setting it up at the start of your project. If you do it, then you're fine. If you change halfway through, you're in trouble. That, okay, so that's the key, right? Yeah. It has to that you have to know in advance. This this happened to me recently. We were discussing this, where someone was asking, like, okay, so if, if I want to do a five one mix of this thing I just finished. 
it's like, well, you're, you have, you're basically having, you have to start over, right? Yeah, <laughs> really? yeah. I mean, everything you did specifically for stereo, it's, it's not going to work once you convert every track into a, a multi-channel, you know, free roaming five, one track. Right. Um, this is a, a personal question, but what are, what are your thoughts? I've shared mine on things like Atmos. So, you know, now we're, we're beyond 5171, 10.2. Now you've got speakers above you. It's like you've 78 speakers, speakers right? You're surrounded in a cube of speakers, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm curious what you think about that. I, I'm, I'm not saying it's overkill. I'm saying if the responsibility falls on a separate audio mixer and team to deliver that, I'm all for it. If you pile that onto the film editor, then screw that. No way. Beat it. Beat it. Mm -hmm. I'll do five one. I'll do stereo. I'll build it deep, and I build really deep. I have my timelines up on my screen of six below. The first cut was two hours and fifty minutes long, or forty nine. Our final edit was an hour thirty two. I had to cut an hour and was it hour and seventeen minutes of what I built for the final mix. Yeah. But you can see, like I build, you know, twenty thirty audio tracks deep because I want to fill in those gaps and stuff. I can do that in stereo in five one. I don't have the time or the energy or the it's not my responsibility to do Atmos. I'll go watch an Atmos movie, but yeah. as long as they don't pile it onto the editor's job, we already have enough to do. We love you all, directors and producers. Don't fucking don't put that on us. Seriously, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it. And on that note, all right. Oh, and by the way, last question: Someone was asking, does Premiere do seven point one? No, unfortunately, it does not. Uh, so you'd have to. You can add it. You can export five one, then open it up and add, create, make exactly. a seven one somewhere else. Yeah. Exactly. Also, yeah. by the way. No difference in a theater environment. Sorry, I'm going to say it. No difference. Also, not a fan of Atmos. And with that, friends, it's been amazing, Vashi. Thank you so much. We've Dude. got more programming coming up. We've got the XD Creative Challenge. So stick around for that wherever you are in the world. I will be back uh, next week. We have uh, Friday off this week, so I won't be doing a master class. But until then, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Vashi. Be sure to stick around. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank Take you, care. everyone. Thanks so much for having Bye. me, Jace. All right, you got it, man. Bye-bye.